Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I want to say thank you to Jennifer Allen, who sent a donation to the podcast, and I really appreciate it. I do this full-time, and every dollar that's given to me helps keep all of it going. You can support the podcast through Patreon for $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There's various tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. And you can also donate to the podcast like Jennifer did. Just go to CanadaEHX.com and click Donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin. Now both of those are reaching their end of their runs, so I'm going to be launching two new podcasts. In May, I'm launching Canada's Great War, where I look at Canada in the First World War from beginning to end. And in June, I'm launching Coast to Coast, which looks at the building of the Transcontinental Railway. I'm really looking forward to getting these out there, and I hope you guys enjoy them. And They'll be available on all podcast platforms. Today, I'm looking at the history of Grand Prairie. This is an important one to me because I used to live near Grand Prairie, up near Fairview, and I went into Grand Prairie many times. So, let's get right to the history, and as usual, I won't be doing a chronological history, but looking at various aspects of the city's history. So let's begin. The Indigenous For centuries, dating back long before Europeans ever came to what would be Canada, the Beaver people occupied the lands that would eventually be Grand Prairie. By the early 1800s, fur traders had started to arrive in the area and traded with the Indigenous, and the Northwest Company would establish a fort at Dunvegan. Originally, the area was called Buffalo Plains, as it had huge herds of bison that migrated through along with large herds of elk. Through the latter part of the 19th century, due to displacement by the Europeans and Canadians, the Cree and Iroquois would settle in the area, all the way down to Jasper and Lac St. Anne. Today, the community sits on Treaty 8 land. The Founding of the Community The first reference to the prairie around Grand Prairie comes from Samuel Black, a Scottish fur trader with the Northwest Company. In 1880, the Hudson's Bay Company fort was established 21 kilometers north of the current city by George Kennedy, and the post was called La Grand Prairie. Around this same time, Canadian Pacific Railway engineers were visiting the area, and they reported the huge agricultural potential and rich resources of timber, coal, oil, and gas. As the Klondike Gold Rush kicked off in 1896, prospectors began to move through and as many as 700 migrated through in just two years. By 1908, George Breeden, the local blacksmith, was operating a dirt-floored, sod-roofed cabin that he called the Breeden Hotel, which was used by travelers who arrived in the area until they moved on to their homestead. In 1909, 17 townships were surveyed in the area, and a land rush quickly began as people came along to buy up land. One year later, the new Grand Prairie town site was subdivided, and within one year the community had a bank, hotel, post office, and land office, and was becoming the largest community in the area. In 1911, the Edson Trail was bringing settlers to the area thanks to the clearing of bush to make the journey easier. And at this point, the community had a bank, barn, two churches, a land survey office, and barracks for the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. In 1913, a school and hospital were built. On April 30, 1914, Grand Prairie officially became a village. In 1916, the future of Grand Prairie was set when it became the terminus of the Edmonton, Dunvegan, and British Columbia Railway running from Edmonton. With the arrival of the railroad, the population began to skyrocket and soon passed the 1,000 resident mark. On March 15, 1919, the community became a town. When the short recession of the early 1920s hit, Grand Prairie saw its population decline slightly. While it had 1,061 people in 1921, the population had fallen to 917 by 1926, but by the 1930s the population was rebounding, and in 1931 it had increased to 1,400 people. The town would continue to grow through the next several decades, aided by the Second World War and the arrival of more people along the newly paved Highway 43. During the Second World War, 500 Canadian and American Air Force personnel were stationed in the community, 
On January 1, 1958, Grand Prairie became a city. The ceremony to become a city was actually quite unique. In February of 1958, residents lined Claremont Road to cheer Henry McCullough as he rode in minus 40 degree weather from Edmonton to Grand Prairie along the Edson Trail with his horse Diamond. He carried with him the new city charter, which was presented to him by the Premier on the steps of the Alberta Legislature two weeks previous. Today, Grand Prairie is the home to 63,000 people and it's the 7th largest city in Alberta and the 88th largest city in Canada. That growth was fueled by the Elmworth Deep Basin Gas Field Discovery, and the city would go from 12,000 people in the 1970s to 24,000 by 1981. A second boom from 2006 to 2007 made Grand Prairie one of the fastest growing cities in the country. The Heritage Discovery Center Located in Grand Prairie, you can explore the entire history of the Peace Region dating back to the Mesoic Era, through the Ice Ages, to the Indigenous and today. The Heritage Discovery Center is home to several hands-on exhibits and a life-sized animatronic dinosaur that represents the Pachyrhinosaurus species that has been discovered in the area. Visitors can stroll through the galleries at their own pace, learning through the interactive displays. The Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum If dinosaurs interest you, the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum is a paleontology museum located nearby in the city of Wembley. Named for paleontologist Philip J. Curry, the museum is located in a 41,000 square foot museum grounds along the Pipestone Creek bone bed that contains fossils from the Cretaceous to the Paleocene eras. The original bone bed was discovered by a local school teacher in 1974 and thousands of fossils have been found in the bone bed. Today, it is considered to be one of the densest fossil sites in the entire world, and as a result of the huge abundance of fossils, the bone bed has been called the River of Death. Along with fossils of the Pachyrhinosaurus, there are also fossils of the Hadrosaur, Tyrannosaur, and many others. The building of the museum was actually delayed due to funding, but Dan Aykroyd, a paleontologist enthusiast, organized a two-day celebrity dig at Pipestone Creek Park. His wife, Donna Dixon, as well as Lauren Michaels came out for the event, the building was officially opened in 2015 and drew 100,000 visitors within its first 11 months, double what was projected. My wife brought us all here. Uh, her passions are my passion and uh, she came last year and uh, saw this incredible uh, deposit of not only bones but also scientific knowledge and talent in the paleontological field. And she was really, really moved and came back and just was raving about it and that's all we've been hearing about for a year at home. And, uh, you know, the children also shared her enthusiasm and um, I said, you know, next year I've, I've got to go and see this. A lifelong dream to be a paleontologist, but it takes a lot of schooling and, and studying, which I, I haven't done. And then I sort of feel like I've been very lucky to, to worm my way into this, this great event and getting to, to search for some bones. So we're here mainly to provide what celebrities can provide. Celebrity is good for three things. You can get a good table in a restaurant occasionally. Uh, a Mountie or a state trooper will sometimes let you off a speeding ticket, although not always. And then the third thing is to bring awareness to, to good causes. And uh, uh, so that's, that's what we're doing here. The Governor General Visits On August 10, 1933, the first of many important visitors would arrive in the growing community of Grand Prairie. The Governor General of Canada, the Earl of Bessborough, along with his wife, the Countess of Bessborough, came to the community and were greeted by throngs of well-wishers who came out to see the Vice Regal and his wife. Mayor Tooley had the entire city decorated with flags and flowers, and an evergreen arch and pillars were erected at one of the business corners. Upon arriving in the community, the Vice Regal and his wife were greeted at the school grounds with war veterans standing as the Guard of Honor. An address was given by Mayor Tooley, and the Governor General stated that he was pleased and surprised by the evident beauty and growth of the country, and that he is glad he came in August rather than October as was planned the previous year. At the banquet later in that night, 200 people attended, and several musical numbers were conducted for everyone who gathered. The Grand Prairie High School Built in 1921 and located in downtown Grand Prairie, the Grand Prairie High School replaced three schools that had been built between 1911 and 1929 
to accommodate the growing population of students. The school was one of the top schools in northern Alberta, and today it is one of the oldest structures within Grand Prairie. The school serves as a symbol of the settlement period of Alberta's last remaining agricultural frontier before the wave of Depression-era immigration came to the Peace River area. Today, it's home to the Prairie Art Gallery and was made a Provincial Historic Resource on May 7, 1984. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. Saskatoon Mountain Sometimes called Saskatoon Hill, there's evidence of this mountain having human habitation going back 9,500 years. One of the more interesting facts about the hill is that it's the only site in the area not to be subjected to the effects of a glacier during the last ice age. The plants found in the area were not found anywhere else. The first homestead on the mountain was owned by Frank Greer. Due to its history, the provincial government would turn the area into a provincial park where people came to gather berries and picnic but everything would change when the site was chosen for a new radar site and 214 acres of Saskatoon Mountain were leased to their federal government, restricting access to it for the citizens of the area. The provincial park was removed, but parts of the remaining area of the provincial park, not being used by the radar site, were leased to farmers to graze their cattle. The radar site itself would be built on the former homestead of Fred Greer, where a forestry tower had been set up as well. Under the Department of Defense, the area had a pine tree radar station that acted as part of the early warning radar system that was set up by the United States and Canada in the case of a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Things began to change in 1985 when an announcement of the closure of the site came. Among the 49 civilians working at the site, 26 were eligible for a transfer, but 80% of those wanted to stay in the area if they could find suitable jobs. In June 1988, the military began packing up, and by the end of June, nearly everyone was gone from the site. On August 31, 1988, the gates closed for good at the radar site. Over the next year, all evidence that there was a radar base there had been removed except for the radar tower. The site was then seeded with grasses and allowed to regenerate into its natural state. In 1992, the site was returned to the province of Alberta and the main radar tower would stay in place until 1994 when it was finally demolished. On July 26, 1995, Saskatoon Mountain was designated as a natural area that covered 1,766 acres, and today is an Alberta Provincial Park once again. McNaught Homestead One of the first homesteads set up in the region was the McNaught Homestead, set up by Charles and Eliza McNaught in 1911, when they were part of a second group of Christian Association settlers who came from Ontario to the Peace River area, although they were not affiliated with the group. In those early years, the farm consisted of six buildings that still stand at the site, including a two-story log house, a pump house, two barns, a schoolhouse, and a chicken coop. This is one of the most complete collections of buildings dating from the first wave of settlement into the Peace River region, Another important aspect of the homestead is that the daughter of Eliza and Charles was Euphemia McNaught, who came to the region with her parents in 1912. She was a highly gifted artist and would attend the Ontario College of Art in 1929 and was instructed by J. E. H. McDonald and Arthur Lismer, 
two members of the group of seven. She would come back to the homestead of her family and set up a studio in the former schoolhouse on the property. She would gain national renown for her work, including having it displayed in 1931's Calgary Stampede. In 1942, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King would commission her to document the construction of the Alaska Highway. She was the founding member of the Grand Prairie Art Club and was made a lifetime member of the Alberta Society of Artists in 1985. In 1977, she was awarded the Alberta Achievement Award of Excellence in Art, and in 1982, she was the first recipient of the Sir Frederick Haltane Prize. She would pass away in 2002 at the age of 100, and after her death, many of the pieces painted at the schoolhouse on the McNaught Olmstead were featured in the National Gallery of Canada. The Heritage Village the Grand Prairie Museum's Heritage Village is a great site to explore the buildings that used to be part of the growing community. On the village grounds, you will find 18 different buildings that highlight the history of the community. Well, I won't go into all of these, but I will touch on some that were quite interesting. The Edson Trail Caboose is an early version of what we would call today a modern camping trailer. It allowed families to travel along the Edson Trail from Edmonton to Grand Prairie, while also bringing their belongings and giving them a temporary home when they settled on the land. These cabooses were not just used as homes, but were also used as the first hospital and post office in the community. The Hermit Lake Schoolhouse was built in 1916 and would hold classes for students ranging in grades from the 1st to the ninth grade. Typically, the school only had 10 students per year and would operate until 1956 when it was closed to become a community centre. In 1977, it was moved to the Heritage Village. The oldest building in the entire area is the Hudson's Bay Outpost. It was built in 1896, south of Dunvegan, where two major trails crossed. It would operate until 1902, and it served as the home of Tom and Phoebe Williams from 1916 to 1923. For decades, it was not used and slowly fell into disrepair until it was restored and moved to the Heritage Village in 2002. The Tempest House was built by George and Ann Tempest in 1934, they would live in that house for several years, and it was the house that the Kelscombe Hill Post Office would operate out of until 1940. The Dunvegan Bridge One of the most striking man-made features on the landscape north of Grand Prairie is the Dunvegan Bridge, which spans the Peace River. I've been to this bridge many times, and I have to say pictures don't do it justice. It's actually really quite beautiful to see, especially in the fall, or summer, so if you're in the area, absolutely check it out. For 150 years, traders, missionaries, and settlers in the area would take a raft over the Peace River. And when a bridge was built in Peace River, others would take the huge detour to go around that bridge rather than take the ferry. Everything changed in 1960 when the new Dunvegan Bridge was built. The suspension bridge, the longest in Western Canada at the time, spanned the river and helped open up quicker travel from the communities such as Fairview to Grand Prairie. The bridge stretches for 274 meters with a deck width of 8.2 meters. And in order to build the bridge, 750 tons of reinforcing steel, 26,000 cubic yards of concrete, and 140,000 bags of cement was required. The Queen Visits It was a big day for the entire Grand Prairie region when on August 1st, 1978, the royal couple, Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, arrived in Grand Prairie as part of their Alberta tour in honour of the Commonwealth Games. Grand Prairie was one of the stops for the Queen and Prince Philip in their 12-day, three-province tour of Canada. And of course, things didn't get off too smooth when the royal couple was an hour late behind schedule due to some poor planning regarding distances by Buckingham Palace. While the event was almost declared a civic holiday, the city instead encouraged businesses to give employees three hours off for the visit. When the royal couple arrived in Grand Prairie at 11.35 a.m., they were met by local MLA for the region, Dr. Winston Backus, and his wife. Mayor Al Romanchuk was quite unhappy with this change of plans, as he felt he was supposed to greet the Queen as she arrived at the Grand Prairie airport. He would say, quote, I was slated to meet her and they took it away. I have no idea why. Tradition is to have the mayor greet her. End quote. A petition was sent to Peter Lougheed, but that didn't change anything. As soon as the couple landed, they were driven to where the future Queen Elizabeth II hospital would be built, 
and the Queen then turned the sod on the new building, along with Prince Philip, Premier Peter Lougheed, and Mayor Alex Romanchuk. She then unveiled a plaque to dedicate Grand Prairie's first Pioneer Hospital, and for lunch the royal couple traveled to Grand Prairie Regional College, where they watched performance and met with the Board of Governors. The Queen and Prince Philip then met various local dignitaries, including Miss Grand Prairie, Barbara Vavrick, as well as 94-year-old Maud Prophet. During a demonstration by the Battle River Saddle Club, the Queen repeatedly laughed out loud at the young members of the club who kept tumbling off their horses and became entangled in sacks and combination foot and horse race. During this demonstration, the Queen and Prince Philip were joined by local senior citizens and First World War veterans. Mayor Romanchuk then presented the Queen with a painting of the Peace Region by artist Robert Guest. At 2.15 p.m., the Queen and Prince Philip would leave Grand Prairie for Peace River, the most northerly visit in Alberta to that point. And by the end of the day, the Queen was back in Edmonton for a performance at the Citadel Theatre in Edmonton and the opening of the Commonwealth Games. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Grand Prairie. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Doug Campbell, Reg W, Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lorianne Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke Guess, JP Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash Canadian History X. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G. B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.